In the previous talk in this series, we saw some vibration modes of some of the musical instruments that you see in this picture here. We saw some behavior of a guitar and of a violin. But we didn't see everything that's relevant to the low frequency vibration of these instruments. There's another important ingredient, and that's the topic of this talk. Something most of these instruments have in common is that they have an enclosed volume of air in the box, and then they have a hole in it, or in the case of the cello or the violin, a pair of holes. That geometric configuration of a volume with a relatively small hole in it introduces the possibility of a different kind of vibration mode, and we can illustrate that in the first instance uh, not with a musical instrument, but with this bottle here. Everyone, I think, is familiar with the fact that if you take a bottle like this, a glass bottle, you put your thumb in and you pop it out, you hear a sound. And it's a sound with a musical pitch to it. So there's a resonance going on there. What's happening? Well, it's nothing to do with the glass vibrating. I get a quite different noise if I tap the structure. That note is entirely to do with the behaviour of the air inside the bottle and around and about the neck. And it's something called a Helmholtz resonance. Let's have the slides back. So here's a schematic diagram of that bottle. Except I've drawn something that you can't see. I've drawn a kind of imaginary cork in the neck of the bottle. And what that is representing is the behaviour of the air just in that neck region. Underneath that, once we've got this imaginary cork in the bottle, the rest of the volume has air trapped in it. Now think what happens with a bicycle pump if you put your thumb over the end and then push the pump. You feel the confined air inside the pump pushing back at you. It behaves like a spring. So the trapped air inside the box is like a spring. Now the air in the neck can flow in and out through the neck and there's a kind of slightly ill-defined blob of air schematically indicated by this yellow square here which acts a bit like a mass sitting on top of that spring. You attach a mass to a spring, you've got inertia and restoring force, you get a resonant frequency. And that's the essential behaviour of these things called Helmholtz resonators, named after a German physicist of the late 19th century, who did, among other things, uh, a several important things to do with musical instruments and musical sound and the way we perceive musical sound. Right, so we turn to instruments. Here are two familiar views of instruments, just highlighting the fact that there are holes, whether it's a pair of F holes or a single circular hole. And then behind that, uh, you have this wooden box. The difference between the violin and the guitar on the one hand and my milk bottle that I just showed is that in the case of the milk bottle, the glass was to all intents and purposes rigid and the behaviour you were hearing when I popped my thumb out of the bottle was just the Helmholtz resonance of the air vibrating. Now in these instruments it's a little more complicated because the box itself of course is meant to vibrate that's what makes most of the sound from a violin or guitar we'll come to that in the next talk. So my analogy with the bicycle pump the air inside the violin or the guitar box is not quite feeling a rigid wall all the way around it. As the air pressure goes up inside, it will inflate the walls of the box a little bit. And as the air pressure goes down, the walls will deflate a little bit. And the result of that is that these air vibrations from the Helmholtz resonance will be coupled to the vibrations of the box. Now, here's a picture we saw in 
the previous talk, some vibration modes of a guitar. And I'm now going to particularly focus on these first two. Now, they look suspiciously similar. They look, these contour lines of the mode shape, look roughly the same in both cases. What's going on? We shouldn't be able to have two vibration modes which are essentially the same. And the reason those look the same is that there's something we can't see in these pictures. And the thing we can't see is the air, the invisible plug of air vibrating in and out through the sound hole. So there's a sort of schematic diagram of what that resonance of the top of the guitar looked like. It's just bulging up and then, of course, bulging down in the next half of the cycle. That's sitting on top of this box with the sound hole in it. Now we can kind of abstract that combination into the diagram shown on this side. So we've got a mass here sitting on a spring and that's representing this mode of the top plate of the guitar which has a certain mass and a certain resonant frequency. So the mass is the mass, the spring is suitable to get the right resonant frequency. Here's the interior cavity and here's the sound hole, and again, I've, I've given it a neck like the bottle here and drawn one of these little yellow invisible air mass blobs into it. Now, when the air pressure inside the cavity goes up, it acts on our yellow blob here, but it also will act on the, this piston representing the body mode. So changes of the internal air pressure influence both the Helmholtz resonance vibration and the structural vibration of the plate of the instrument. And that means that instead of just getting two, one mode, we get a pair of modes and neither of them is purely a body mode or purely a Helmholtz air mode. They involve coupling of the two. And we're going to get a schematic animation of that here laid out in the way that looks like the the right hand diagram in the previous slide. I'm just showing these two pistons here. The top one represents the body mode and the lower one represents this invisible blob of air in the sound hole. And there are two things here because there are going to be two modes. So we animate these and for typical parameters of a guitar you get two mode shapes that look like this. The one at lower frequency, you can see it's at lower frequency, has got the two blue things moving in opposite directions. So the main motion is the airflow in the lower piston, but there is a bit of motion of the body which is in the opposite phase. But we also have a mode at higher frequency and now the two red lines are both moving in the same direction. They're in phase with each other. So both the air from the sound hole and the plate vibration are vibrating in the same phase. And those are the two modes that we saw in these holograms, but I've now added a little yellow circle to connote this invisible air mass. So in this lower one of the two modes, the air mass is actually the main motion there is plate motion, which is what's being visualized in this holographic image here. But if only we could see it, the airflow would be much bigger and it's in the opposite phase to the plate motion. Then there's a higher mode. In the case of a guitar, it's roughly an octave higher, where the plate motion and the air motion are actually in the same phase as you saw in the previous animation. Something similar to that happens in the violin, but it's more complicated. I deliberately use the guitar to illustrate this because this pair of modes just makes it rather easy to picture it. And if you thought my right hand diagram in the previous slide looked a little bit like a loudspeaker enclosure, you would not be wrong. Exactly the same argument applies to a certain design of loudspeaker cabinets called ducted loudspeakers which use exactly the same trick. They use a Helmholtz resonance uh, coupled to the behavior of the loudspeaker, essentially to extend the bass response. So what are the key points here? 
any enclosed volume of air with a small opening will have a Helmholtz resonance of this kind. And a non-musical example of that, which will be, I think, familiar to everyone, is that effect you get if you open the window of your car a little bit. And if you just open it a bit, you get a rather low frequency, whoomp, 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 which, uh, which is very annoying. That's a Helmholtz resonance of the air inside the passenger compartment of your car breathing through that hole from the partly opened window. Stringed instrument bodies, most of them, make use of this trick and essentially they use it to boost their bass response. It just happens to be the case, the way the numbers work out, that you can make this Helmholtz resonance have a relatively low frequency from a fairly small enclosure. Whereas modes involving the wood vibration, it's, it's difficult to get a low frequency without making the box bigger. Now there's always pressure to make musical instrument bodies reasonably small for ergonomic reasons. So the design of many instruments makes use of a Helmholtz resonance to pad out the bass, to produce an extra resonance down in the bass. But as I've said, with the guitar in some detail, but equally true for the violin, the instrument body has flexible walls. So this Helmholtz air resonance is coupled to the vibration of the wood of the structure, and that makes everything more complicated. The air frequency, the pure Helmholtz air frequency, would be governed just by the hole size and the shape, the shape of the neck, and by the volume of the bottle or whatever. But in the case of a guitar or a violin, it's also influenced by the flexibility of the plates. If the plates are more flexible, essentially it will make the volume feel as if it's a bit bigger. The change when the pressure goes up will, will not all occur through breathing through the sound hole. And many makers manipulate this resonance, especially with something in the guitar world called a tornavos. If I just flash back through some slides, this picture of the guitar sound hole, maybe you wondered what this bit of wood uh, was that you could see in the bottom here. This is something guitar makers sometimes do. It's called a tornavos. It's essentially giving a bottleneck to the inside of the hole. It's making the invisible air mass a bit heavier and that makes the Helmholtz resonance a bit lower and so it's a trick for extending that bass even in a rather small bodied instrument you can make this air resonance be rather low in frequency and that's probably the first example we've seen in these talks of a bit of acoustical engineering being used by instrument makers to, to a musical purpose to improve the bass response of a small bodied instrument. We'll meet other examples of that kind of thing in later talks in this series.